moderator, asking a couple questions to Lori uh, about his case and his extradition victory. Uh, and then uh, Grace North here, the head of the Jeremy Hammond Defense Committee, is going to talk about some of the specifics of that ruling. It really got pretty detailed uh, about, um, about U.S. prisons and the issues. Uh, and Bear Brown, who has been in U.S. prisons, is going to talk about uh, efforts at reform and how, how just impossibly bureaucratic uh, and terrible it is to try to get uh, the most basic grievances redressed. Um, so the Courage Foundation supports whistleblowers, but we also support truth tellers uh, more broadly, people uh, like people hackers like Jeremy Hammond, Lori Love, um, who make important truths uh, public um, for the betterment of the, uh, the public debate. Um, so we support these individuals, but we advocate for them in a way that um, attempts to better the situation for whistleblowers and journal journalistic sources more broadly. Uh, and probably our most exciting victory to date came earlier this year. We successfully defeated the U.S. attempt to extradite Lori Love to the United States. Um. <laughs> so, Lori Love, I'm so glad you could not be with us today. <laughs> so, uh, can, you, can you talk about the, the question of jurisdiction? So, uh, you were investigated in the U.K. for a crime that allegedly happened in the U.S., uh, and the U.S. wanted to extradite you in three different jurisdictions. So can you talk about uh, uh, why that was? Yeah, sure. I mean, you may be being over generous to the U.K. law enforcement by saying I was investigated. I think um, the Department of Justice just said this is the guy we want you to uh, inconvenience, and they did. Um, but the problem was I wasn't charged under U.K. law, which would ordinarily be the thing that happens if you're accused of criminal activity. Uh, so... After about a year and a half after I was arrested, uh, I was re-arrested uh, by the extradition units at the Met Police. And the reason for that was that three concurrent jurisdictions in the US uh, very much requested my presence uh, so they could lock me up for 99 years, um, which is completely unparalleled. I don't think even uh, Osama bin Laden or Pablo Escobar or anyone like that has been uh, attempted to be extradited three times at the same time. Um, luckily, they weren't successful. And the, the issue here is why does the USA, um, why does the Southern District of New York, for instance, have jurisdiction to prosecute crimes allegedly committed by a person in the United Kingdom? And more importantly, why does only the US get to exercise this uh, extraterritorial jurisdiction? Um, why do they believe that their laws apply to the entire world? And why have they arrogated to themselves the position of uh, enforcers of the internet and this is troubling so where we are now is uh, the jurisdiction is back to where it should be in the UK and we're waiting to see if the uh, prosecutors here will take up the case. So you're facing 99 years uh, as potential maximum in the US what is what are you facing in the UK what's what's good what's the worst that could happen? Yeah so there's a very interesting discrepancy in the uh, sentencing um, regimen here in the UK to the US um, Ironically, the reason they wanted to kidnap me and lock me up for the rest of my life was for alleged participation in a protest after the tragic death of Aaron Swartz. And Aaron Swartz was hounded to suicide exactly because there was so, so much leeway for prosecutors to pile on charges uh, in order to put duress on a defendant to uh, bargain away their constitutional right to a fair trial uh, through plea bargaining. Um, so, um, Whereas uh, in the US, I would be facing, as you say, up to 99 years, and it would be incredibly onerous on me to take the deal. Here in the UK, the maximum sentence for the alleged offending would be 36 months, of which you'd expect to spend half a year in custody. Um, so that's quite a big difference. That's like a 50, 50 times ratio. And something is a bit skew if, if one country can treat things so aggressively relative to another, and then have the um, goal to come in and step on their justice system and attempt to take it over. Uh, we at Courage were excited about your about the ruling in your extradition case, not only because it kept you over there, but also because they made use of the forum bar and they criticized U.S. prisons. Um, but that was like the first first test case of the forum bar, right? I mean, it's it was instated after Gary McKinnon's case, but can you talk a little bit about the history of that and, and why that was so important? 
Yeah, sure. So um, the first thing to state really is that the extradition treaty between the USA and the UK is um, exceptional, would be the nice way of putting it. Perverse is the most accurate way of putting it, in that the USA doesn't have to provide a single solitary shred of evidence to extradite a person. And I want you to bear this in mind because there could be a very big extradition case coming up that's going to have ramifications for journalism and democracy more generally, and they will not have to prove a single thing in that process because it's all by assumption. Um, so the forum bar was introduced after, um, in uh, early 2000s, uh, the USA attempted to extradite another young man with um, Asperger's syndrome called Gary McKinnon, who had been looking around allegedly on some Pentagon and NASA computers, uh, not to commit crime, not to aid a foreign adversary, not for personal profit or gain, but out of uh, curiosity and civic mindedness. Um, they attempted to extradite him. There was a 10 year battle. He lost legally at every stage. And um, it was only because of a massive public campaign that pressure was brought to bear on the Home Secretary at the time, Theresa May who um, refused to sign his extradition. After that, that happened, they changed the law um, to do two things, a dub double-edged sword. They took away the discretion of the Home Secretary to consider human rights implications of extradition, which again, I want you to bear in mind, considering what might be happening in the near future. The person who signs the order that means somebody is rendered from the UK to the USA is not allowed to consider whether their human rights will be breached. Um, but as a fig leaf, they offered the forum bar, which was that if it's in the interest of justice to prosecute domestically, rather than in the requesting country, then it should be done so. And nobody was successfully able to argue that until this case. So we have established that at least it's a workable um, provision in law. And hopefully what it will do is change the calculus of whether prosecutors try to go for extradition or try to do the sensible and reasonable thing, which is prosecute under the laws of the the jurisdiction in which the crime is committed. I know some some British Muslims who have faced extradition have have not been so fortunate um, in avoiding extradition. Um, but now we have this precedent of the forum bar. Um, mm. Do you think this victory is going to be able to apply more broadly and to especially to help the more vulnerable? I, I do hope so. Um, it's important for me to acknowledge and to um, make explicit to everyone else that I've been afforded some privileges in my case in that my skin is the right color or at least when it's not red um, it's not brown and therefore i've had a lot more opportunity and i've been given a better ride in the press and i think the courts extended more sympathy because i do not adhere to religions that are associated wrongly with um, uh, extremism and uh, because i'm white and relatively uh, capable of putting on a middle class accent um, there have been a lot of people who have not had such a fair ride through the UK extradition system. Um, good, good organization to uh, look to to learn more about this is CAGE in the UK. Um, and what I'm hoping is uh, that there is a precedent set by this case um, whereby um, if the USA attempts to request the extradition of uh, a person who has not committed a crime physically in that country, um, then there will be a presumption that this should not be allowed. Um, and the other important thing about our ruling was it was it was based partially on my uh, health conditions, but it was also heavily informed by the absolutely abhorrent conditions in US detention facilities, and the, the Bureau of Prisons, but also the county jail system, um, where there is absolutely no accommodation for uh, neurodiverse people with autism. There is no effective healthcare provision for people with depression, people who may be vulnerable to uh, suicidality. Um, and there is extensive and disgusting use of solitary confinement. And we see this especially with uh, political uh, dissidents. Um, Jer Jeremy Hammond, for instance, um, and Barrett Brown on the panel here, um, Matt DeHart have all been subject to uh, solitary confinement. And this has been described by uh, qualified professionals as being tantamount to torture. So there is a massive amount of work to be done to reform uh, justice and detention in the US or abolish uh, these systems. And, and hopefully the uh, ruling that we got, because it shed light on how terrible the conditions are, will um, help people that are trying to drive that reform. 
All right, I want you to jump back into the conversation later and let me know if you'd like to, but that sounds like a good time to hear from Grace uh, talk about the, the specifics of the ruling and, and what it could mean for U.S. prisons. Hi. So as he said, uh, solitary is used extensively in the U.S. prison system, and one of the ways that it is used is supposedly to sort of deter inmates from committing suicide. In Suicide Watch, you are put alone in a cell, you are stripped of all your clothes, of all your possessions, you are put in a paper smock, and you are sat there for the entire day and monitored via camp via cam camera. This obviously uh, presents a problem when you're dealing with someone who is already mentally ill. As he said, uh, solitary confinement has been ruled by every major human rights group in the world as a form of torture. So when you're dealing with somebody that has pre-existing mental health conditions and you put them in a situation like that, you're obviously not improving the situation at all. You're actually making it worse. So. Um, in the actual ruling, the judge that handed down the ruling uh, said that social isolation was known to precipitate psychotic episodes, including psychotic depression and increase in suicidal I ideas, a severe deterioration, deterioration in clinical depression, a likely recurrence of psychotic ideas, a severe deter deterioration in his physical health should be anticipated. Su suicidal risk would increase to very high in consequence, exacerbating rather than reducing the risk of suicide. So you're really at a point, especially with Suicide Watch, where the solution to the problem is actually ex is exacerbating the problem. Um, also in the ruling, the judge talked about the appalling conditions of, for people who are mentally ill in the prison system. He specifically focused on two of the prisons that uh, Lowry likely would have been transferred to, which are MDC, M MDC, which is in Brooklyn, and MCC, which is in Manhattan. And in it, he's, the judge said that in reality, only two or three psychologists were available in each institution for direct inmate health care. Positions were often kept vacant because of cost and the ratio of inmates in need of care for significant psychological difficulties to staff psychiatrists was about 100 to 130 to 1. That meant that for every 100 and to 130 prisoners, there was one doctor. Um, and that those doctors did not just deal with inmate men mental health, they had other tasks as well. Uh, he said at MDC, MCC, the number of inmates likely to have significant psych psychiatric difficulties yielded a caseload of 500 inmates out of 2,461. If all were seen weekly, the workload would be 12 in inmates per hour, meaning you have five minutes with a psychologist. Um, two of the items of primary note were first a report of a federal ma magistrate describing the conditions for female inmates at, M at MDC as unconscionable because of the absence of, sun of sunlight, fresh air, air conditioning in the heat, outdoor exercise, and receiving very poor food and medical treatment. There was a, there was a report of a visit in June 2016 by the National Association of Women Judges to MDC that made the same points. It noted that the, BO that the BOP then said it could not find physicians willing to work in a New York prison and that conditions had been, quote, unconscionable for three years. So really what this says about the overall conditions of American prisons is that they are horrendous. Medical care, even physical medical care is just non-existent. For example, a simple, simple request. Um, Jeremy needed glasses. Glasses, seems simple enough. Uh, a, and glasses, it seems like a little thing, but when your lifelines in prison are getting mail and reading books, glasses are super important. He had to wait three years to get glasses. Um, another case that I worked on, the case of Stanley Cohen, uh, he told me a story. Uh, he was in pretty much the lowest of low security camp you could possibly be in, the type of camp where they regularly let prisoners go home for the weekend, kind of low security. Um, an inmate complained for four years about stomach pains that progressively got worse and worse and worse. He went to the prison doctors. The prison doctors dismissed him for four 
years. They said, you're faking. You just want to get out of work. It's not that bad. You're fine. Here are some Tums. Go back to work. Uh, one day, he was working on the prison grounds. He was on a ladder fixing something or painting something. And he fell off the ladder. And he hurt himself to the point where he actually needed to go to an outside hospital uh, for x-rays and treatment. And while he was at the hospital, uh, they found out that this inmate had stage four stomach cancer. And um, that had basically been ignored for the past four years. Um, and this inmate then applied for compassionate release to be released to his family so he could go home and spend what little time he had left with his family. And the prison denied it. Um, so, I mean, all of this, I mean, when you look at it in the larger picture, uh, if physical health care is this hard to access, mental health care is even harder to access. And prisoners suffer. They suffer immensely. Um, and the fact that the extradition was blocked largely on humanitarian grounds, um, I mean, really speaks to just the abysmal state of the US prison system. And you know, we have all these talks about, well, we need to reform it, we need to reform it. Reform is not enough. It is 100% not enough. Not enough is being done. The system as it is cannot be reformed. Reform is sort of like rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic uh, at this point. So. So stay over there, Lori. <laughs> please, please don't, please. Right. Please don't come here. <laughs> So Baird has been in U.S. prisons and he's been thrown in solitary and he's tried to, he's had his books taken away and he can talk a little bit about efforts to, to redress grievances. Yes, so back in, uh, prior to 1996, it was, uh, the courts were somewhat accessible to inmates, both in state and federal uh, uh, institutions. In uh, 1996, Congress passed the Prison Litigation Reform Act which put the process by which an inmate in the U.S. who wants to challenge any terms of his confinement, wants to challenge any due process violation, uh, you know, whether he's being held in his shoe illegally for years and years or is being beaten by guards frequently or a number of other things, you know, running down to little mundane things that, you know, like with the glasses sound mundane but uh, are often very significant. Uh, they first have to conduct what's called the administrative remedy process. This process uh, is under the control of the prisons themselves. To do so, in, in, to conduct this process and, and thus be able to access the courts at all, you first have to fill out what's called a BP-8. This is in the federal system. Uh, then you wait about a week uh, or more, depending on them, to get a response back. And then you have to fill out a BP-9, which goes to the uh, upper staff of that administration at, at, at the prison you're in. Uh, then you'll wait uh, a couple months and you'll get that back. And uh, if, you, if you still do not feel that your grievance has been remedied, and it usually has not, you can send a BP-11, I believe it's called, to the regional BOP offices. And there's a number of uh, months you'll be have to wait after that. And then uh, if you don't like that, you can send it to the national BOP office. And if you don't like that, then you can go to court. And that's usually about two or three years later. Uh, even if you have gone through that process, the, at every, there is no repercussions uh, for any prison to interfere with that process. As in, it, if they claim falsely that you missed a deadline or whatever, uh, you can point that out. And I did that not just in my filings uh, after that. I also did it in uh, a column I wrote uh, from prison for The Intercept, in which I documented the entire process over about two years. Uh, they knew that I was writing this column, but they were confident enough uh, in the uh, uh, ethical shortcomings of the American people and of the Congress that it wouldn't matter what I wrote. So, uh, uh, so I was thus luckily able to get a, a pretty good uh, uh, provide a very good sort of example, you know, uh, of, of what it's like, not just for me, but for prisoners all over the, all over the country. Um, and, and so, they, so they, they interfered at every level of the process, and, and, and they can, and if, even if they get caught, even if it, uh, finally a judge acknowledges they did, there's no, nothing will happen to them. Um, so they do it. And, and that's, that's, that is fundamentally the, 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 the chief problem that prisoners in the U.S. face, uh, that they do not really have due process. Uh, e even to a lesser extent than we on the outside have due process. They have even less. And uh, without that, 
those measures in place, uh, it is difficult for them, uh, without resorting to violence, to uh, address their grievances. And so that's why we have riots, uh, demonstrations, uh, that sort of thing. That's one of the reasons. It's one of the legitimate reasons why we have them. Uh, I spent about six months all together in the, in the SHU, uh, which is a special housing unit, which is, uh, you know, it's a 23-hour day lockdown, usually 24-hour day lockdown in a, in a small cell. I actually sp uh, stayed at one in Siegelville, Texas, that used to be an uh, internment center for German Americans during World War II. And that was an interesting SHU right there. It's one of the more interesting ones I was ever in. Uh, and so, you know, and so, so uh, across the board, whatever, and I explained this, uh, I tried to explain it to the BBC uh, when me and your father, uh, Lori, uh, Larry, uh, went on there to talk about your case, tried to explain that uh, it is important that the U.S. prison system uh, is incapable of housing uh, inmates in a, anything approaching a civilized way. It is important that the DOJ itself is, is acknowledged universally. Uh, to be broken. There is no one who, who, will go, who, who will defend the arguments outside the DOJ that the DOJ works. Uh, it does in some, some ways. I mean, just like the FBI does successfully do some things, but it's also, they're both overridden, just absolutely uh, just wrought through with, with institutional uh, deterioration. I'm not sure how else to refer to it. Um, but anyway, so there is a lot that needs to be done to reform these things. Uh, some of these, some of these methods involve inmates themselves. Uh, you know, some uh, s stuff that we can do on the outside. Uh, uh, I've mentioned in my talk yesterday the pursuance system, which, which briefly is a framework for mass collaboration. We'll be having a uh, one of one of the entities uh, that we create for this pursuance framework will be a prison reform deal using the media. But uh, you know, beyond that, you know, it, it's important to explain to people in England, for instance, uh, into France, and here in America, that they're, they're used to a certain kind of, of system of justice that is not perfect by any means, but which uh, is, in the end, a system of justice uh, in some way. Uh, and they tend to think that the U.S., they tend to assume that the U.S. being a Western country uh, that derives, you know, in the case of England, that derives directly from their jurisprudential traditions, that we will be similar. And it's just simply not so. Uh, and that's why it's important. What, what Courage is doing is so important. And that's why what uh, Lori Love's uh, case was so important. And, it, and it's why uh, th those who continue to take risks uh, to do things that are right, uh, even knowing what we know now about how these things work and, and what you're going to be subjected to, watching Lori's case, you know, looking, seeing how far they will go to capture someone in England for doing, uh, for allegedly conducting things, uh, crimes uh, on the level of things the DOJ and U.S. government do every single day. Uh, we have to respect them all the more for continuing to work after having seen what happened to those of us who got caught. I think it's worth mentioning uh, that the extradition victory was the second big victory in Lori's uh, more than four-year uh, long battle. Uh, first, the uh, NCA, the British police, uh, seized like 30 of his uh, digital devices, uh, only gave back 25 of them because they were still trying to decrypt the other ones. And they tried to get Lori to, to hand over his passwords and he refused. Could you talk a little bit, a bit about that and, and how you won that? Oh, can't hear you. Wait, we can't hear you. Okay. Yes, I am microphone. Yeah. Um, yes, I was in a strange position of uh, being arrested in 2013 by um, essentially a UPS delivery guy, you know, somebody dressed up as a UPS delivery guy and 11 of his friends um, masquerading as police officers, and, um, and then not charged with any crimes and uh, kept on bail for about nine months and released from bail, and at that point I began inquiring as one would uh, as to where my things were and if I could have my things back. And um, for people who don't know, the, there are procedures for uh, arrest, search and seizure, and with digital devices the standard operating procedure is to image them and return the hardware, um, because not returning the hardware when somebody hasn't uh, been uh, adjudicated as having been guilty of any crime is a interference with their goods and business. Um, so this wasn't done. Um, in uh, rather than having my things returned, I was uh, offered a piece of paper 
that said words to the effect uh, that if I didn't give them some passwords and e phrase crypt cryptographic information, um, I could be locked up for two years um, for not complying with this section 49 legal order. Um, so I didn't, I didn't feel compelled. Um, instead, I kind of made them a counter offer of under what conditions I would entertain this request. Um, conditions such as you know, they'd have to prove um, that there is encrypted information on the device, which is non-trivial. They would have to prove that I'm capable of decrypting that information, which is non-trivial. And most importantly for, for me, they would have to prove that they can <laughs> coerce me into working for uh, law enforcement whose objective in this context is to lock me up, um, which is very, very problematic. Um, so uh, I said no to this order. Um, what they should have done is taken me to court to try and um, apply that two years stick uh, incentive. Um, they, didn't, they elected not to do so. And then um, I continued to ask for my property back. And when polite negotiations were going nowhere, I um, in, invoked a piece of civil uh, law called the Police Property Act from 1897, um, and it just says that they, they, they're not they're not investigating you if they don't intend to charge you, then you, you get your stuff back. It's a very simple administrative remedy. And um, when I tried to take it to court, the solicitor for the National Crime Agency very sneakily um, suggested that the court set a direction that the case could not proceed unless I give them these passwords. Um, which again is very troubling. So you know, just to zoom out a bit, people turn up at your house in disguise to get in there, they steal your stuff, you're not charged with any crime, you threaten to be put in prison for not helping them you know, read some things that they think they might be able to read, uh, then your property is kept from you for years, and in order even to have a hearing, to have it returned, um, you've got to pony up this supposed information to help them uh, fathom what's on the devices. Um, luckily, we, uh, we had this case they were successful the first time they set this direction because it was in front of three um, not particularly professional lay magistrates who um, didn't see a problem with it. Um, and we, I dropped the case, picked it up again after the extradition and transferred it to the same court where the extradition hearing was held. And in, in that court, the judge found that they could not um, preemptively require a person to undermine their own security in order to exercise the right to property which is very fundamental, in a way more important than me getting extradited or not, is do we have, do we have the right to own ones and zeros? Do, do we have the right to have data and the only way to actually possess data is to securely possess it? Because if it's not secure, it's not yours. It's the next person who uh, picks up your laptop when you go to the toilet or the next person who uh, breaks into it or you know, whatever. So if there is a presumption against having a right to property in itself if the government cannot arbitrarily inspect the contents of that data um, it's going to be fundamentally challenging to, to uh, journalism but to uh, civic society in itself because unless you can have information that is yours and under your control um, you are under totalitarianism you know it might be a soft glove it might be an iron fist but uh, unless you have agency and autonomy over your information uh, in an age where information is the, the currency and the leading means of exercising power in the world, um, we're fucked. And I'd rather we, we, we would not be fucked. And so uh, my advice to everyone you know, uh, listening and attending here is um, assert your right to, uh, to, to use cryptography, assert your right to have data secure, and assert your right to say no um, if somebody else wants to uh, have access to your things um, unless they can prove through a functioning court system um, such as you guys do not have and we do not have but in a, in a hypothetical world in a functioning legal system they might be able to prove the need to, um, to, to open up cryptography but the presumption should be that your data is yours and um, we, we want a small victory in that but it's very much an ongoing battle. I think Grace had something to add about uh, prison grievances. Yeah, I had something real quick to add about prison grievances, but beside them being this sort of labyrinthian, 
process that you have to go through. Uh, if you file too many, the guards will retaliate against you. Prison workers will retaliate against you. That can take various forms and just generally messing with you, calling you out on things that would normally let slide. But it is a very real danger that if you speak out too much, um, you will receive negative pushback from prison guards and prison administration for that. And Barry, you f felt like you were personally targeted, right? You were retaliated against in prison? Yeah, everyone did. Uh, I, was, I was thrown in a couple times on investigations. Uh, one time about an hour after they did a radio interview over the uh, phone, which is what you're permitted to do, uh, technically. Uh, then another time, what was it? Oh, yes, uh, for two weeks. Another time when I uh, did a, was doing a, a phone interview with Alex Winter, who was doing a documentary with me at the time. Uh, and a uh, assistant warden demanded I meet with them in private about an administrative remedy grievance I had filed against him, and I uh, told him I would not meet with him in private about that, uh, that we had to follow the procedure. And uh, so there's a good recording that Alex got over the phone of me being pulled away from the phone by the prison guards. And he used that for his uh, uh, relative, the documentary called Relatively Free that he did with uh, Laura Poitras later on. A couple of people have come up to me and said, like, Free Barrett Brown was going, he, I thought he was already out, but you still have more than $800,000 in fines, restitution? Yeah, the judge ordered me to pay $800,000 to Stratfor, which is a uh, Austin-based uh, intelligence contractor that does illegal black ops works for other corporations here in the U.S. and for uh, uh, repressive regimes, regimes abroad. Um, and so they've, that, you know, the order itself obviously was, was widely criticized because it had, there was really no basis to it. I'm not a hacker. Uh, the, the, the hack of Stratford was known about by the FBI. I didn't know about it until after they did. Uh, I could not have stopped it if I wanted to, and I did not want to, of course. But uh, anyway, so uh, yeah, I have a bunch of money, and they've used that to uh, send subpoenas to The Intercept, which I used to write for, and to my publisher, uh, Macmillan, you know, Farrar, Strauss, and Garreau, and to my agency, my literary agency. Uh, demanding all communications, demanding all information regarding payments. Uh, about a year ago, they didn't send, didn't send an order to my publisher not to pay me any more of my advance, uh, uh, advance, which I was my sole source of income, uh, until further notice, and that further notice turned out to be quite further indeed. Uh, just now, I started being able to get income again legally uh, after a year, a couple weeks ago. So, hope we made clear why it's a really good thing that Larry's still over there. Um, but we have a little time for questions. Uh, if anybody has any for for Laurie or Barrett or or for Grace or or anybody. I can re relay things to Laurie if you can here. Hey, um, so I, I have a question. Just, I, I would particularly like to hear Barrett's thought on this, but uh, all of you for sure. Just in looking at the prison system and the legal system generally, I think when we're trying to create an analysis of how we've gotten this level of unaccountability and, and the mass kind of physical infrastructure that lets these kind of things happen, I think we have to, if we want to look for like opportunities to create collaboration or opportunities to actually make meaningful change, we have to look at the, dr the drug war and what it's done in terms of building prisons and in terms of you know, it's created so much demand for incarceration that everything else has had to give, and that includes all of our fundamental rights. So I, when we're creating these coalitions, I, I think that that has to be part of our analysis, and I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Yes, I, that, that's absolutely true. I mean, that, that's why the drug war is, is one of the, uh, opposition to the drug war is one of the several tenets we've, we've sort of put as ideological markers that you have to, that you're, what we want you to agree to if you come into the pursuance framework uh, when it, when it uh, launches a few months from now. Uh, it, it, obviously, the drug war has been used to, to erode every single one of our uh, uh, amendments in the Bill of Rights. Every single one has been affected by that adversely. Uh, there are things that police would have no uh, viable way of doing uh, if there was not the constant possibility that anyone in this room may be violating the law right now by possessing something. Uh, that's obviously changed uh, all of the entire society and, and, and has, has had a very de deleterious effect on our governments, our institutions. Um, so yes, that, the, the drug war something has to be has to be opposed uh, along with uh, these issues that the drug war has helped to exacerbate. Uh, question for Lori. Uh, I don't know what your lawyers have said about uh, the possibility of you traveling 
in the future? Will, the, will the, another extradition attempt be a tried if you go to France or Ireland or something else? Oop, we need to need your mic. Is the question about whether I can travel? Uh, yes. More or less, yes. Uh, so, uh, no. Would extradition uh, case be requested if you tried to go to France, for example? Yeah, so this is exactly the problem. Uh, um, despite having nominally defeated the, the US Department of Justice as regards my extradition from the UK, there is, there is nothing under international law stopping them from inconveniencing me, even, uh, even in Scotland. So, you know, I could go up and visit my family in Glasgow, and because it's a separate court system, they could put the process over again, and France, Germany, um, definitely couldn't go to Southeast Asia because they have a track record of literally kidnapping people from airports. Um, and, um, you know, rend extraordinary rendition is still a thing that happens. So um, I'm in the very strange position now of having to, in a way, cheerlead, if not facilitate my own prosecution under UK law. Um, just so that I can get into the same position as the uh, Lolsec, um defendants can, who now have been convicted and can travel, you know, to some extent around the world and visit the USA. Um, not that I especially want to until the current regime falls, um, which you, you all could help speed up if you want. Um, but yeah, so my prison is now in Wales. <laughs> And um, what I'm going to be doing is uh, Her Majesty, the Queen, owes me uh, several thousand pound travel expenses. And so when I get that back from her, um, I'm going to get a van and I'm going to tour England and Wales, launching a campaign of boycott, divestment and sanctions against the USA. And um, this is something that started... <laughs> Um, been ongoing for some time with respect to Israel because they are um, an oppressive apartheid state and unfortunately the USA is uh, trying to catch up and children are being caged. Uh, you are in the early to fr fruition stages of uh, fascism and um, you know I've got nothing against the people that are there, you're, you're kind of trapped by the condition you're in but um, people need to push back against the way uh, the USA is conducting itself. Um, and so I'm going to be promoting that quite heavily in the future because I can't really do much outside of the country. So piggyback, piggybacking a little off of that, uh, yes, America is in the early stages to sort of middle stages of fascism, um, and we should not allow that. We here right now need to be pushing back against fascism where and when we see it, including this conference right here this weekend. The tech community is a community that is beautiful, is a community that is diverse. We need to be embracing that. We should make fascists fucking afraid to show their faces in public. Let, let me add, uh, please, uh, there are a number of federal contractors uh, at Hope. Uh, one of, one's name is Tom Ryan. He's uh, well known. He's a long history. We, you know, that's aside from the usual, you know, FBI agents. We have, you know, a guy. We, we have people here who, who you know, are either Nazis or are highly sympathetic to Nazis, and not all of them are just visitors. So fuck fascism. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think we've all signed the statement: no fascists at hope. And yes. Courage has, has added its name to that. Can I add something to this? Yep. Uh, what, one of the things that um, the people in this crowd especially need to realize if they haven't, and I think there has been a break out of consciousness with it, is that um, the things that will enable uh, fascism in the 21st century will not necessarily be jackboots and um, physical oppression out in the streets, but it's going to be subtle things like algorithms that uh, affect uh, your ability to interface with reality through your newsfeed and your freedom of association through social networks and the way that people are silently herded um, into virtual pens um, by the way um, social media is currently run. It's a hegemony of unaccountable private interests. Um, but also on an even smaller level, like by, by a thousand cuts, everyone who is writing a line of code 
and is not sure that they're able to exercise their right to have a conscience about how that code is being used and whether it will form a system that takes away people's rights and consolidates power to um, unpleasant people who would like to persecute uh, minorities. Um, this is going to be a massive problem because power is now algorithms, power is now code, power is how data moves from one place to another. And you can see with IC that people can end up uh, on the, the business end of horrific detention because of a combination of uh, algorithms or you know pattern matching or, uh, filters that s suddenly come together and pluck them away from their family. And this is incredibly pernicious and we need to all be thinking about what the hell have we unleashed with this Pandora's box of technology and how we can stop it from being that thing, thing on the uh, you know um, Raiders of the Lost Ark that eviscerates everyone because we are in danger of having this turnkey totalitarian internet and this is the last fork in the road to stand up and say no we want, we want the open internet that empowers and, uh, and brings people up and gives opportunity and doesn't increase the power and control of people that are already um, bringing about horrific things in the world. Um, this was actually brought up this morning in a talk by the Lucy Parsons Lab. Um, they were talking about how uh, Amazon recognition was being now sold and marketed to police departments to incorporate facial recognition and to body cams and things like that, which again uh, is obviously very troubling, but doesn't just stop the police departments. It could go to border control ICE and then you then get, of course, all these databases of just people who are innocent, but are people of color, people who are further marginalized because they're the people that are mostly at the receiving end of police oppression. I wanted to bring up a concept like uh, of in the past, how we would deal with a lot of these corrupt legal systems, you know, governments that stole from us, did not have proper due process, you know, the, the traditional method of dealing with this was to emigrate. You just got the fuck out of a place that had a rotten legal system or, you know, rotten law, um, rotten institutions. And it seems like, you know, now that we've kind of expanded to the borders, you know, since uh, the early 1900s, we don't have that physical ability anymore to emigrate. Um, I've been kind of enchanted with this concept of di digital immigration, uh, of emigrating into, you know, uh, a digital space where, you know, our rights, our property, for, you know, the extent possible, we can immigrate into that space. Are, you, are anybody on the panel um, kind of sensitive to these issues, aware of, you know, ways in which we can do that. Um, just interested in hearing your thoughts on kind of a potential new wave of digital immigration. Thanks. Laurie, if you didn't hear that, it was about uh, digital immigration uh, when we don't have the ability to physically immigrate. Yeah, um, yeah so one problem is um, the, so some of us, I guess a lot of the people here at the conference uh, or listening, um, came to the internet voluntarily. They, it was a thing, they were early adopters and they were part of it when um, when it was an idealistic place where there was a possibility of um, transcending some of the um, uh, ludicrousness of uh, physical based reality. Uh, unfortunately for most people the internet um, collided into them and suddenly they find themselves part of digital spaces. Um, they've never had the opportunity to have uh, an understanding that those spaces need to come with rights and protections. And then um, um, we, we saw the death this year of the um, author of the Declaration of Independence of Cyberspace. And it's, it's worth rereading that and having a think about how we're actually um, going to assert um, control for ourselves as communities over digital spaces. Because at the moment, we exist in a neo-feudal situation, um, you, you might have a, a niche interest and you use a subreddit and um, unfortunately it's up to a few people that you do not have a, a reasonable power uh, relationship with to decide whether how your space is policed and controlled. Um, and so the ability to emigrate digitally to exist in different spaces can only exist if we can actually assert um, some control and some representation and to have some notion of civil rights as they apply in online spaces um, and 
as regards uh, replacing um, uh, systems that are fundamentally broken, such as unfortunately the courts in the US, the detention system, and um, arguably, I would say, um, the, the system of democratic franchise, um, because of the toxic influence of money and uh, other things more recently. Um, we, we need to actually build for ourselves, forge for ourselves effective replacements where our power is built in. And um, I, I would defer to people like Barrett right now, who is um, uh, building the Pursuance Project as, as a model for how people can organize and collaborate together in a way that is not vulnerable to co-option and control by um, censors and oppressors. Okay. Yes. Uh, sorry. Specifically about the uh, I, I didn't hear all of that. The the, uh, the project we're doing for the, for the prison reform. Just the ability of uh, pursuance to to allow people to okay. securely. Okay. Right. So pursuance is a framework for mass civic collaboration. It's something that we've uh, refined. It's, it's an idea we've refined over years and years. Uh, that I've uh, during which time I obviously had a lot of interesting experience, got to observe a lot of interesting things involving online collaboration vis-a-vis -vis anonymous Tunisian revolution, uh, crowdsourced research, which my group Project PM did. Uh, it will enable participants uh, uh, start with a hand, starting with a hand-picked population. Uh, we've got about 2,000 individuals and organizations that have signed up to participate thus far. We'll, we'll probably have a lot more in the next uh, six months. Uh, those people who, who, who strive to a basic open, open society philosophy will be brought in. Uh, they will then bring on other participants and so on and so forth, uh, you know, at a rate of about five a month, that will be the limit. Uh, anyone in, in the pursuance system will be able to create a entity called a pursuance, which is a, sort of this a living organizational chart, uh, something that kind of draws upon what we now know about the best ways uh, in, which to, in which to provide a space for collaboration. So every individual will, will be in a, uh, entirely in consent-based, sort of informed consent-based entities in which they have signed on, uh, understanding every step of the way who they're working with and, and being in, in control of that in ways that aren't always possible uh, in some of these more amorphous organizations and movements. Uh, it'll be something that can grow, that can, that can uh, nonetheless remain refined as it grows, even refined further. It's something that will allow existing institutions like NGOs to create presences by which to better take advantage of their uh, existing supporters and constituents in ways that go beyond fundraising and signing petitions. Uh, it will allow just all the individual people out there who, who are tired of, of the way things are going and who have lost uh, some of their faith, at least, in, in institutions that we used to rely on, uh, to come into somewhere where they, they will have an opportunity to, to work, just to stop these things. And that's very important. It's important that they be provided uh, the ability to do that securely. Uh, we're living proof of that. And uh, so this is an open, in an encrypted open source system. You can read more about it. Uh, you can see it on GitHub or our pursuanceproject.org uh, website. Another question. Um, so, <clears throat> too tall for me. I have a question for you about the grievance process. And so kind of a background about why I'm asking is, concerning the private prisons. We had a friend who was in a core civic facility and he was placed into solitary confinement and we were able to compel the sheriff to do a welfare check. Right, oh, Which is, um, it was a lot of, like hundreds of people who compelled them and so they did go out and when they came out they gave a very unsatisfactory response that if you can think of Walmart being a private entity, that we don't have the right to go and ask them about the internal um, running of their corporation. And so they told us essentially that Core Civic, being where they detain our citizens in a prison, that we didn't have the right to know what was happening with them because they were private. Right. And so. My question is, is the grievance process the same in that, being that there is very little oversight whatsoever in the private prison system? I, I know less about the private prisons than I do the, the federal ones. I have been in a couple of uh, what we call uh, federal overflow facilities that are run semi-privately by counties in Texas, and those are <coughs> the worst ones. Like, I've never, anyway, I don't want to go into that. But, uh, 
I, so I don't know. I don't. Uh, the, the grievance process is supposed to be applicable, however, to private prisons. As in, I mean, the private pr inmates in private prisons are still supposed to be able to seek redress in the courts, uh, and I believe that they have expanded the, the 1996 uh, bill. Uh, and I may be wrong about this. But I believe they've expanded it in some way to also cover private prisons. In fact, I have seen some 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 stuff on that process existing there. Again, but I would find, I would consider it to be, it's probably less reliable even than the ones we're used to dealing with. If, if you would also please, if you could, uh, my email address is on my Twitter account. Could you please send me information about this incident with the sheriff and the welfare check? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. And you know, this also applies to, I don't know if you know what happened in Tennessee with another core civic facility where they actually had a scabies outbreak and they were putting anybody who yeah, tried to tell anybody they had scabies into solitary confinement. Yes. They finally released word into the media, but by then the scabies had gone all the way up to judges and all of the administrative people up until then because prisoners come in contact with those people. And so it was like the same thing where they didn't have this system of grievance where they could go and redress that. And it wasn't until right. judges got it that anybody Okay, yeah, that's, that, <laughs> I'm glad they did. So. Um, <laughs> Same. But yeah, it, it's it's just universe. It's a universal problem. It's it's every, every single problem is, is covered by this. It, that's why the, the administrative remedy process mm -hmm. is such an important thing to focus on. Uh, we're talking about prison reform. Thank you. All right. If there are no more questions, uh, thank you all for coming out and uh, appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Courage has a table in the vendor table section, so please stop by and say hi.